Welcome to my channel. If you like the content, please subscribe for more. I caught her deleted messages. I've been in a relationship with my significant other for almost a decade now, and we have a toddler together. Recently, she started acting strange and making excuses to stay late at work. One night, she was being shady with her watch, and when I asked to see it, she argued with me and told me to check her phone instead. This behavior made me suspicious, so I checked her watch and found messages between her and a younger coworker. Initially, she had lied and said it was just kisses, but I found out through deleted messages on her iPhone that there was potential for more. Although there wasn't full-blown S-time, they had engaged in Ocaneal activities and made plans to meet up, which the coworker later backed out of. The fact that she talked poorly about me to him hurt even more, as she claimed we weren't married, which is true, and that I didn't pay attention to her or spend time with her anymore. When I confronted her, I told her I needed time to gather my thoughts and send her to live with her mom. She begged and cried for another chance, and since then, she has quit her job, stopped working after school changed her phone number, and blocked the co-worker, all in an effort to show me she wants a fresh start. However, I've started blaming myself for her infidelity. I wasn't giving her the same attention or compliments, and I spent long hours playing video games after work because I was remodeling our house. I also didn't show commitment by marrying her, even after we had a child, and I've been drinking excessively and picking fights due to stress. Although we were trying for another child, Negative pregnancy tests made her disappointed, and I've used this to justify her action. Part of me wants to forgive her, but I don't want to become a jailer who constantly checks her phone and brings up the past. I don't know what to do. Redditor's Reactions Next story after. Redditor 1. The only reason she is begging for another opportunity is because, as you stated, he doesn't want anything to do with her. Op. Answer. The truth hurts, man. It even felt as though the app had more sympathy for me than the one I called partner. I appreciate your answer greatly. Redditor 2. Infidelity is a hard line of no return. If they cheat, the relationship is over. No questions, no discussions. Done. Reconciliation fails in over 90s of cases. It fails because the betrayed partner likely can never overcome that level of betrayal. They are stuck with the images in their heads of their partners engaged with the app. That's hard to overcome. Further, most cheaters won't do the work necessary to learn why they cheated and fix the issue. So odds are very high that they'll simply cheat again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Nope, if they cheat, it's over. Your partner's infidelity is never your fault. You could have been the worst spouse possible, but all that does is give your partner the right to leave the relationship. It's not a E U L relationship. It's not AF whomever you want card. They cheat to satisfy their own emotional shortcoming. It has nothing to do with you. They are just lousy people who betray the one person whom they swore to never hurt just to satisfy their own selfishness. In order to truly try for reconciliation, the wayward partner has to be completely 100 up front with the full truth of their infidelity. If they withhold anything at all, then reconciliation fails. If they hold back on what they've done and the betrayed spouse uncovers new information, the betrayed spouse is dragged back to D-Day all over again. Second, the wayward partner must block and have no contact with the app. If it was a co-worker, the wayward will need to leave that job and find a new one. If they remain in contact with the app, reconciliation fails. Third, the wayward partner must give the betrayed partner 100 access to everything, phone, emails, social media, etc., location finding, etc., the betrayed spouse will need that access to feel secure in the newly forming relationship. This isn't negotiable. If the wayward spouse refuses, then there's no reconciliation. Finally, that wayward spouse needs counseling to discover what emotional shortcoming they have that caused them to feel like infidelity was okay. Reconciliation fails in 90s attempts, usually because the wayward partner can't resolve their own issues and refuses to do the work necessary to allow the relationship to become secure again. They want to rug sweep and pretend like nothing happened. Meanwhile, the betrayed spouse is shattered emotionally and has no one to turn to for support because the person that shattered him is their partner. Sure, the wayward spouse will show some effort for a short time, but six months to a year down the line, they begin to resent the betrayed partner for their inability to reconnect and just get over it. Little do they know the emotional damage they caused often takes years to overcome. Thus, 
the wayward spouse stops working at reconciliation and the relationship fails. In your case, I'd be filing for a court-ordered parenting plan and finding a new place to live with your child and tell your wayward partner to get out of your life. Op answer. Thank you for your well-thought-out response. The greatest war is happening in my mind and I'd, and ache if it is because I love her or because I want to stay for our daughter. Your response in time is appreciated more than you. Redditor 3. This woman keeps trying to have another baby with you but cheats at the same time. Hmm. Man, I hope that you just simply get away from this selfish monster. Story 2. My name is David. I graduated from a vocational school and have been working as a caregiver for the last 14 years. I met my wife Tatiana through my friends, and we've been married for five years now. After getting married, we lived alone for a while, but after some time, we ended up moving together with my in-laws. At the time, I didn't anticipate how my wife would change. I moved in with Tatiana's parents because her mother had broken a bone. Even after she was discharged from the hospital, she needed someone to help take care of her. My father-in-law wasn't confident in his abilities to take care of her himself, so I heard they were considering moving to a senior home. But since senior homes are expensive, Tatiana decided I would move in with her parents and take care of her mother, not that she asked me how I felt about it. On top of everything, I ended up moving in with them by myself since my parents had already passed away. My in-laws loved me as if I was their own son. I wasn't against helping take care of them, but the fact it was decided without my say made me uncomfortable. My mother-in-law loved living in their home, which was full of memories for her, and my father-in-law was happy being together with the wife he loved so dearly. So I was glad that by me helping out they wouldn't have to move, but their house was an hour drive from where I lived with Tatiana and a two-hour drive from my work. So to be able to focus on taking care of my mother-in-law, I had to leave the place I worked at for 14 years. It was impossible for me to quit so suddenly, but after I spoke with my bosses, they helped me adjust my work schedule for my final months. I moved in with my in-laws as soon as my mother, in-laws, as soon as my mother-in-law was discharged from the hospital. After she was discharged, I made sure to avoid any very late or early shifts. While I was at work, my father-in-law would do what he could to help out. When I first moved in with my in-laws, my wife would visit us every weekend, but she slowly started showing up less and less, and eventually she'd only come once a month. Tatiana no longer comes to visit, huh? She should move here too, my father-in-law has been saying that a lot recently. My wife's company has a branch near her parents' house, so she requested to be transferred there. Once they accept my transfer request, I'll move in to live with you, she kept saying. But six months passed, and there was no progress with the transfer. Tatiana would always come up with excuses like it's not the right time, and things are busy at work, so they won't let me transfer now. I thought it was a bit suspicious, but I trusted her. Two months later, my mother-in-law died suddenly from pneumonia. Tatiana never visited, even when her mother was in critical condition, nor did she help with the funeral. She once whispered to me secretly, I'm glad my mom went first. Tatiana smiled as she said that. I pretended I couldn't hear, but I guessed that since all the family property was under her father's name, if he had passed away first, things might have been more complicated with the inheritance procedure. I resented my wife for valuing her inheritance more than her parents' lives. I ignored her and just focused on helping my father-in-law with the funeral proceedings. The funeral memorial service went by without a hitch. Just when I was able to catch my breath, my father-in-law said something I never expected him to. He suggested that we stop living together. I had believed that Tatiana would be transferred soon and we would live as a trio with my father-in-law, so his words came as a shock. Since his wife passed away, my father-in-law had been getting weaker and weaker, so I was against leaving him on his own. I told him that I wanted to keep living with him and that I would be too worried to leave him alone. I also reassured him that Tatiana would be transferred soon, but my father-in-law was insistent and even suggested that I divorce Tatiana and live on my own. I was taken aback by this and asked him why we couldn't live together as a family of three. However, my father-in-law remained firm in his decision. He even suggested that I visit Tatiana at our old home to understand why he wanted us to live separately. Although I had considered visiting our old home before, I never got the chance due to my mother-in-law's illness. But my father-in-law told me that I didn't need to go back there and that he would bring anything I needed to me. I was in shock and didn't know how to respond to my father-in-law's question. All I could think about was the evidence I had gathered at our home and how devastated I felt. I couldn't believe that Tatiana would cheat on me and empty our bank account without even telling me. 
I didn't know what to do next or how to confront her about it. My father-in-law noticed my distress and asked me what was wrong. I hesitated at first, not sure if I should tell him everything, but eventually I decided to confide in him. I showed him the photos I had taken and told him about the empty watch case and our drained bank account. He was shocked and disappointed in his daughter, but he also expressed concern for my well-being. He suggested that I take some time to think about what I wanted to do next and offered to help me in any way he could. I appreciated his support, but I still didn't know what my next move should be. For the next few days, I was in a daze, trying to process everything that had happened. I didn't want to believe that Tatiana could be capable of such betrayal, but the evidence was too overwhelming to ignore. I knew that I couldn't continue living with her, but I didn't know how to break the news to my in-laws or what I would do next. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to tell my father-in-law what had happened. He was disappointed in his daughter, but he also understood my decision to end our marriage. He offered to help me with the divorce proceedings and even offered to let me stay with him until I found a new place to live. I was grateful for his support and kindness during this difficult time. Despite everything that had happened, I knew that I had a true ally in my father-in-law, and that gave me hope for the future. And I asked her to come home to see her father. I didn't mention the private investigator's report or the fact that I suspected she had been unfaithful. Tatiana agreed to come home, and when she arrived, my father-in-law and I sat down with her to talk about his behavior. We gently suggested that he might need to see a doctor to assess his memory and cognitive abilities. Tatiana was initially resistant to the idea, but after some discussion, she agreed to take her father to a specialist. The diagnosis was dementia, and the doctor recommended a course of treatment that would help manage his symptoms. Tatiana was shocked by the diagnosis, and I could see the guilt written on her face. She apologized for her behavior and promised to do everything she could to make it up to us. Over the next few weeks, Tatiana worked hard to prove her commitment to our family. She spent more time with her father and helped us navigate the challenges of his diagnosis. She even suggested that we all move in together so we could support each other through this difficult time. Although it took some time, I eventually forgave Tatiana for her infidelity. I realized that she was going through a difficult time and that her actions were a result of her struggles rather than a reflection of her love for me. We worked together to rebuild our relationship, and over time, our love grew stronger than ever before. In the end, our family came out of this experience closer than ever, and we learned the true value of forgiveness and compassion. I was shocked and devastated to find out that Tatiana had not only cheated on me, but had also abandoned her own father who was suffering from dementia. I couldn't believe that the woman I had loved and trusted had been capable of such heartless actions. I filled out the divorce papers that she had left for me and started the process of ending our marriage. As for my father-in-law, I took him to the hospital to get a proper diagnosis for his dementia. It was a difficult time for both of us, but I knew that I had to be there for him. I became his caregiver and made sure that he received the best treatment possible. Despite everything that had happened, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude towards my father-in-law. He had been there for me when I needed him the most and had shown me what it truly meant to be a loving and caring father. As for Tatiana, I knew that I had to move on from her and start a new chapter in my life. It was time to focus on myself and the people who truly cared about me. Yes, he adopted me. It was his way of making sure that someone he trusted would take care of his estate after he passed away. And as his adopted daughter, I have legal rights to everything he owned. I could see the shock and disbelief on Tatiana's face as she realized that she had lost everything. She started to argue with me, saying that she had a right to the inheritance too, but I stood firm and told her that there was nothing she could do about it. As the funeral ended, Tatiana stormed out of the hall, leaving me alone with my thoughts. I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction knowing that justice had been served. My father, in-law's memory would live on through me, and his legacy would be preserved. In the end, I realized that even though Tatiana had caused me a lot of pain and heartache, I had to let go of my anger and resentment. Life was too short to hold grudges, and I didn't want to waste any more time on something that was already in the past. I knew that my father-in-law would have wanted me to move on and live my life to the fullest, and I intended to do just that. I was taken aback by Tatiana's response. She seemed almost relieved that there was nothing left for her to inherit. It was clear that money was the only thing she cared about, not her father or me. As she walked away, I couldn't help but feel grateful that I no longer had to deal with her. I knew that the next step was to move on with my life and start fresh. The next few months were a blur. I mourned the loss of my father-in-law and focused on rebuilding my life. 
I decided to use the money from the life insurance to start a business. It was something I had always wanted to do, but never had the funds for. With the help of my father-in-law's former staff, I was able to make my dream a reality. As I sat in my new office, I couldn't help but think about how far I had come. I had gone from being a struggling artist to a successful business owner. It was all thanks to my father, in-law's kindness and generosity. I knew that I would never forget him and would always be grateful for everything he had done for me. In the end, I realized that life is unpredictable. We never know what's going to happen or who we can trust. But with the help of loved ones and a little bit of luck, we can overcome even the most difficult challenges. I couldn't believe what I was hearing from my father-in-law. It all suddenly made sense. The strange behavior and the dementia act. I was both relieved and shocked at the same time. Relieved that my father-in-law wasn't actually suffering from dementia and shocked that he had gone to such lengths to protect me. As he continued to explain, I listened in disbelief. He had noticed Tatiana's affair a while back and had even witnessed her talking secretly on the phone with her lover on the day of her mother's funeral. I couldn't believe how naive I had been, blindly trusting Tatiana without realizing what was going on right in front of me. My father-in-law had even assisted the private investigator we had hired to gather evidence of her infidelity. I was embarrassed to admit that I had no idea about the affair. When we received the evidence, my father-in-law wasn't surprised, but before we could use it against Tatiana during the divorce, she disappeared. It was then that my father-in-law changed his will, leaving Tatiana with only the vacation home in Maine in order to trap her. He had really taken care of me until the very end, and I felt grateful to have had such a caring father-in-law. As I looked at him, tears streamed down my face, and I hugged him tightly, thanking him for everything he had done for me. Seeing him so energetic and happy, I couldn't help but laugh. It was a mix of emotions, but we both knew that everything was going to be okay from then on. It was a tough decision for me to make, leaving the house that held so many memories of my father-in-law, but I knew it was for the best. I needed to distance myself from Tatiana and all the drama she brought with her. The new job I found as a caregiver was a blessing in disguise. It gave me purpose and allowed me to help others in need. At first, it was hard getting back into the groove of working again. Six years had passed since I last had a job, and I wasn't sure if I still had what it took, but my muscle memory kicked in and I quickly adapted to my new role. I found myself enjoying my work, and the people I cared for brought so much joy into my life. Six months after my father-in-law's funeral, I received a call from Tatiana. I wasn't surprised, but I didn't want to speak to her. Her voice was filled with irritation and anger, complaining about the condition of her parents' old house. I couldn't help but laugh at her reaction. As expected, Tatiana continued to call and email me, trying to threaten me and demand what she thought was rightfully hers, but I didn't want anything to do with her. I rented out the house and moved away, hoping to start a new chapter in my life. Despite the longer commute to work, I don't mind it. My job as a caregiver brings me so much fulfillment and joy, and I hope to continue helping others in need. As for Tatiana, I have no idea what she's up to these days, and I'm content with that. I've moved on and found peace, and that's all that matters.